Uh, my injury happened when I was leaving a shopping center, shopping mall. Um, I had gone on a trip um, to Cancun with one of my girlfriends. We were working way too hard. And she said, let's take a quick trip. And so um, we did. And it was wonderful. We had a really great time down there and spent a lot of time in the sun, a lot of fun in the water. And um, I came home on Sunday because it was Mother's Day. And I wanted to wish my mama a happy Mother's Day. And um, the last memory I have was then my brother actually um, drove me home from my mom's house and dropped me off at my house because my car had been, because we had been gone all that week. And so we were talking about my vacation and I was just preparing things the next day for work. So I, you know, to unpack the necessities for work the next day. And then I went to work the next day and I don't have a memory of that. And um, my sister called me and said, oh, um, we'd like to come over for dinner. I'd love to hear about your trip and everything. And I said, oh, that'd be terrific. And um, so I went to a shopping mall after work to get some moisturizer because got a lot of sun down in Cancun. And um, so when I was leaving the shopping mall, I was making a left-hand turn onto a street that was 35 miles an hour um, with a grass median in the middle. And I say that because I was making a left-hand turn and there was a young man who recently got his license speeding going, they said at least 50 miles an hour who ran the red light and hit me right in the latch of my driver's door. And I was in a little sports car and he was in a bigger, older car. So the force of him hitting me at 50 miles an hour and, you know, my head was like, my neck was even with the window line and the force of that, I uh, twisted my head on the brain stem and lacerated and suffered most of it. And so I guess my car just went uh, rolling into the grass median and there was thankfully an off-duty paramedic who was at the scene who saw and heard the crash and saw my car rolling onto the grass median so he knew I was not any that I was not conscious and so he ran over and I guess they carry radios with them all the time first responders were so grateful we should be so grateful and um how well trained they are wonderful and so he called on his radio there was a fire station right down the street and he called to them to tell them to bring the jaws of life because my car was so crashed in. And I guess they don't normally bring those to every crash scene. Well, I guess how would they know that it's so bad? Um, so he wanted to save time for them to be able to get into the car and get to me right away. And so he ran over to my car and um, he saw that he said, because I spoke to him afterwards, that my head was so far down into my chest that he thought either I had broken my neck or severed my brain stem or both, but either way, it wasn't getting any air. So, you know, the first ABCs is to start an airway. And so he broke the back window, got in behind me. And because he was trained and knew what he was doing, he lifted my head, started an airway. So I didn't lose action to my brain, which was very effective and so helpful. And when he lifted my head, both of my pupils were dilated so he knew I was in real trouble and within the time there were like three minutes like I said the fire station was a half block down and since he had contacted them um they were right there in three minutes and the jaws of life took the car door off um, immediately and you know when you go to a doctor's office they take all your vital signs your blood pressure pulse all that and so when they took my blood pressure they couldn't get any real reading and so they knew there was really nothing medically they could do at the scene. So they did what was called a scoop and run and where the jaws of life then takes your car seat out, scoop into the ambulance, run you to the hospital and on the Eisenhower Expressway, major house, um, expressway in the Chicago area uh, to Loyola University Medical Center, which is where I was taken. Um, and it was 14 minutes from when the off-duty paramedic called when they got me to Lyola's door. So very quick. And um, my body uh, went through the dying process where you go into agonal breathing or your last breath is what it's called. And then you lose control of all your bodily functions. And um, they, they call ahead the paramedics, I guess, always 
to the hospitals to let them know what they're receiving so they have the proper doctors waiting at the trauma units. And so they had a neurosurgeon waiting um, to do an EEG test on my brain to determine life or death status. And it was determined that I did not have enough brain function to keep me alive. So in many states, I could have been legally declared dead. But in Illinois, we have a law that your next of kin, your family member, your caregiver has got to be contacted before you can be legally declared dead. And so they had to put me on life support, even though the EEG showed that I did not have enough brain function to keep me alive. And then I was, after I was put on life support, they then called my mom and dad to make the decision to keep me on or take me off. And my, my dad, we recently, unfortunately lost too soon to cancer. And when his oncologist said to him when he was in hospice, you know, I'm sure Mr. Pepiavis, this was the worst day of your life getting this diagnosis. And he said, no, the, the hearing about Julie's crash, that phone call was the worst day of my life. And we, my family, we're very close. And my dad and I had talked about that. And I can't imagine, I was never able to have children because of my injury, but I can't imagine anything worse than that to have your child be so devastatingly injured and you have to make that decision it's and they were brought in so my parents ran to the hospital or drove very quickly to the hospital and um they were put aside they were taken aside right away by a chaplain a doctor and a nurse and they were told that 96 percent of people with my injury die within the first 24 hours and the four percent of people who live actually are semi-vegetative being toileted and fed in a nursing home and so my parents made the choice to have me cared for at home, you know, for however long that I would live, but certainly to keep me on life support because I was 29 years old and I was training for a biathlon when I was injured. I've always been an athlete and, you know, you, you hope for the best, right? Even though there was a 96% chance that I would pass. And honestly, my parents didn't know, of course, at that time, um, but I did pass and I, that's when I had my experience in heaven with my two deceased grandmothers. So um, I was all of a sudden in this area where um, there were no floors or ceilings or walls. It was light, just like a regular light in a room, except there was a very narrow aisleway to the left-hand side. And the brightest light was on the floor coming up the walls of the aisleway. And I was drawn to go down that aisle way. I wanted to go down that aisle way so bad because I thought that's where I would see God. I knew that I was in that area, in that place. I knew I was in heaven and I knew I was there because I was dead and I was okay with being there. And I wanted to stay there. I felt like I had really, I had gone home, like I belonged there. And the next thing I knew, I was before my two deceased grandmothers. And they looked happy to see me and I was happy to see them. They looked like my grandmas, like before they got ill and they were, we all were smiling. And um, I suddenly was before them and I said, okay, come on girls, let's go. I waved with my right hand and my grandmother said, no, you can't go with us. You have to go back. And I remember feeling very frightened and that's when I was really upset and I said well no I can't go back because I'm not physically okay and I was pointing to my left side that was paralyzed and how I knew I was paralyzed I don't know and she said your body will heal and she and it's not like she was talking with her lips I couldn't take my eyes off her eyes we all had blue eyes and I couldn't take my eyes off her eyes there were the endless tunnels of blue light and I was transfixed on looking at her eyes and I really felt God's presence. And like I said, it's not like she was speaking the words to me. I felt like he was talking to me through her. And then she said, after my body will heal, then she said, go back and be happy. And so I have a book that I have a website that everything is go back and be happy because that's what my grandmother told me to do. And then actually the next memory I have after that was waking up six weeks later because after a month they transferred me from Loyola University to Mary and Joy Rehab Hospital, still in coma. And after I was at Mary and Joy a couple of weeks, 
I woke up from my coma, completely paralyzed on my left side, not being able to see or speak or actually swallow. I was fed through a tube and diapers, com completely paralyzed. But the memory in heaven was the first thing that I remembered. And I'm so thankful that I had that because when I woke up, I it's it's so overwhelming when you're that disabled and you're not able to do anything. And I I just kept thinking and they then later my neurosurgeon told me the suicide for my injury is eighty five percent because if people are able to take their own life, many do because what kind of life really is that? I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible. And um, no one was telling me at that point, you know, what kind of recovery. All people kept saying to me was, oh, we can't believe you woke up. We can't believe you woke up. We, and I thought, why do people keep saying that to me? Well, I had no idea. First of all, I had no idea your brain had a stem and actually it's the top of your spinal cord is really what it is. And it's the, the thing that connects and um, it's what makes your brain speak, to, gives your body a heartbeat. And that's why you can hear a heartbeat in a mother's womb is because one of the first things that's developed in a fetus is a brainstem. It's my neurosurgeon called it your candle of life. I had no idea. I'm an accountant. I had no idea that your brain had a stem and how, how much power it has in terms of life. And so um, that's why I know so many people were surprised, so many medical professionals, and so many have called it a miracle because um, after when I was still in the rehab hospital, they brought me back by ambulance to Loyola for an enclosed MRI where they, you know, get the cage around your head and they filled my brain and spinal cord with dye to see exactly what damage was left and what, you know, I was going to be dealing with at that point. And for anyone who's had an MRI, you know, you can hear the operators like in the tube. And so I heard them and all of a sudden I heard them say, her brainstem is normal. And I said, I can hear you guys. And I thought in my head when they said that, I thought, well, that's what my grandmother said, that my body will heal. And I know that it was God actually saying that to me. And that's what my doctors still call a miracle to this day. Jay. And he said, you know, what do you want to do with this recovery? And I said, well, I want to tell the story of hope. I want to share the story of hope. I, I believe that people need to hear this, that of the healing of my body and to realize that there is hope out there. And I know that so many people, you know, go through so many things and suffer devastating injuries, not just like mine, but just losses in their own life. And I think to really have this hope of heaven, and of healing is is a good thing for people to hear. And I really get a, a lot of response from this and I'm happy to share it.